This is a 2017 Aston Martin V12 Vantage S. This is the old style Vantage. The new Vantage is about to come out, but I figured I'd take a look at the old Vantage one more time because this is a special car. This is a V12 powered Aston Martin made in modern times with a manual transmission. It also costs $190,000. I borrowed this V12 Vantage S from Grand Touring Automobiles here in the Toronto area in Ontario, Canada. Grand Touring is Toronto's dealership for a few high-end luxury brands, Bentley, Rolls-Royce, Lamborghini, Bugatti, and of course, Aston Martin. They currently have this car for sale, and it's sort of the last of its breed. I say that because the new Aston Martin Vantage is coming out, and it's coming with an automatic transmission and an engine borrowed from Mercedes AMG. Aston says a manual will come too, but it could be more than a year away if it really comes at all. So one could argue this is sort of the last old school Aston with the old design language and the old engine and the old interior and the old three pedal transmission. That's especially impressive because this isn't some dinosaur. This is a 2017 model. It'll hit 205 miles per hour and it has a 565 horsepower V12 and yet it has a manual. Most exotic brands have been giving up on the manual, switching solely to automatics, but Aston is still giving enthusiasts what they say they want, though the $190,000 base sticker price has made it a bit of a hard sell. Anyway, today I'm going to show you around the quirks and features of this V12 Vantage, which is surprisingly different from the Vantage that I owned a couple of years ago. After all, there's more than a decade between them. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the V12 Vantage, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also made a list of the coolest stick shift supercars currently listed for sale on Auto Trader. One other quick note, thanks also to Aston Martin Brand specialist Alec Ackerman from Grand Touring Autos for his help with the car. His YouTube channel is linked below and if you're into Aston Martin stuff you should check it out. Now on to the quirks and features. Now I'm going to start off with one of the craziest quirks I have ever seen in any car. Interestingly, it's hidden in the navigation settings in this car. When you go into language to choose what language you want the navigation system to be in, what language you want it to give you directions in, it gives you a bunch of language options and it also gives you a bunch of gender options, but there's a little quirk to that. It isn't equal. For example, you can choose a Czech female if you want to, but there's no option for Czech male. You can choose an Arabic male, but there's no option for Arabic female. You can choose a Dutch male or a Norwegian male, but no females. You can choose a Polish female or a Russian female, but no males. Apparently no one wants to hear a Russian male or a Dutch female speak, and so there are certain genders that only go with certain languages. My favorite, however, is Italian. There are two different options for Italian female, but there is no option for Italian male. So you can choose between two different Italian women directing you in your Aston Martin navigation system, but you cannot choose an Italian man to direct you. I have never seen gender bias in the navigation system before. It is hilarious and really one of the most bizarre quirks I've ever seen. Now, next up, since I'm in here, I might as well continue with some of the other interior quirks. I'm going to continue with the infotainment system. One of the cool things about it is an option you have is the power meter. You select it and it gives precise real-time numbers displaying exactly how much horsepower and torque you're using at any given time. One item I like about the power meter is when you go to it, there is a stern warning that tells you to drive safely that stays on for quite a while before you can actually see the displays in the power meter. The next interesting item, if you go into the navigation system to enter a destination, the first thing that pops up is select a country. You know, I'm in Canada, and uh, it's going to be Canada. Maybe it'd be the U.S., but that's about it. You can see this navigation system was designed for Europe in mind, where someone might actually select a different country since they're relatively small. But here, there's only five different options. You got Canada, Mexico, the United States, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. 
Now, two of those aren't actually countries, but nonetheless, they come up in the country menu. And another interesting item in the navigation system, under points of interest, you have several different categories of points of interest to choose from. I start here with attractions. Now, the interesting thing about this is where I am filming, we are literally next to a theme park called Canada's Wonderland. It's got roller coasters. And yet the first attraction that comes up is City of Vaughan Joint Operations. I don't know what that is, but to me, it doesn't sound like much of an attraction. Also interesting, under entertainment, one of the things they list is a fitness center. I personally am not entertained when I'm working out, but maybe some of you are. Next up, another interesting item in the infotainment system. You can change sort of the overall display theme color, which is pretty standard, not all that unusual. The unusual thing is it gives you different color options that have names, and those names correspond to actual Aston Martin colors, which is kind of cool. There's Flugplatz Blue, which is an Aston color. There's Cinnabar Orange, Apple Tree Green, and you can sort of select those things. They just look like normal orange, blue, and green to me, but it's kind of cool that they named them after actual Aston Martin colors. Next up, another interesting quirk, you can actually change the background image in the infotainment system. You can change it to a number of different options, one of which is leather. If you feel like you don't have enough leather in the car, you can also look at leather on your infotainment system. Same with carbon fiber. If feel like there's not enough carbon fiber, well, you can see a photo of carbon fiber. Those aren't the ones I find most interesting, though. I like that you can also choose cedar, not just wood, specifically cedar. They are very specific about this point. Another option is sand, but when you go to it, it's black for some reason. I guess Aston Martin thinks that's what sand looks like. One other cool infotainment feature, when you go into settings that can be turned on or off, you can see that they actually have a button in the infotainment system that resembles the actual buttons in the car. Here's what it looks like in the system, and then here are the actual buttons in the car. It's kind of a cool little touch. They didn't have to do that, but they did, and it's a neat little thing. Now, speaking of those buttons in the car, they themselves are kind of interesting. Those buttons are used for a few different items, and they're actually glass. That isn't a plastic covering over them, they're real glass. So they have kind of a nice weight to them when you press them. The other cool thing about those buttons is you push them and then there's this like light pipe that lights up in the top of them to let you know that whatever you pushed is on or off. And that's a cool little touch. And speaking of cool little touches, this car is full of them. For example, in the center console, you can see that there is a cup holder. It's very shallow, but nonetheless, you have a cup holder. But check this out. You open up the center console, you can move the cup holder bit back, and now you have a cell phone holder. That's a nice little touch. More importantly, the little divider in the cup holder is aluminum, as you would expect. And that is carried through to a lot of other places in the car. For instance, when you open up this little storage cubby in the center that has a little socket in it, you can see that the inside of this little storage cubby is leather, even though no one will ever use it for anything. It's also worth noting the lid for that little storage cubby is metal, and so it closes with a nice little clink sound instead of a crappy plastic one. Of course, there are also other examples of impressive attention to detail in this car. For example, the glove box is Alcantara on the outside. That's not all that surprising since the dashboard is Alcantara, but check this out. Open the glove box, and the inside of the glove box is Alcantara, even though that's a place that most people will only look in occasionally. Also cool are the sun visors, which just look very expensive in addition to being very small. I especially like the little mirror fitted to the middle of the sun visors, which is tailored to fit the exact perfect size and shape of the sun visor so that you can appropriately look at yourself as you drive down the road. But it isn't all attention to detail and high quality materials inside this car. There's also a few unusual little quirks, and I will start with the key. Now, this key is the valet key. It's plastic, it's fairly unadorned, simple, the boring valet key. You're also given, when you buy one of these cars, a separate key, which is sort of like the vanity key. This key looks almost like a piece of jewelry, like the kind of thing that a guard in Harry Potter would wear around his neck, and you have to kill him with some sort of magical dog in order to gain access to it. Then you get a third key, the sapphire key, which is like 1500 bucks. Now, Aston Martin doesn't call it a key, they call it an emotion control unit. And the way to turn on the car with that key is you stick it into the middle of the dashboard. There's something that says engine start with the Aston Martin logo. Push down the Aston Martin logo with the key and that turns on the car. But the interesting thing about the key doesn't stop there. The most interesting thing to me is the fact that the key doesn't have a little loop so you can put it on your keychain. Presumably Aston Martin doesn't want their key to be included with your lesser vehicles. So Instead, they sell you a little leather pouch you can put the key 
in and then that has a loop on it so you can stick it on your keychain. Two interesting things about the leather pouch. One, it costs $600. So between the key and the pouch, you're looking at two grand. But more importantly, the leather pouch doesn't fit inside that little hole in the dashboard. Meaning that if you wanna put your key on your key ring, you have to have it in the leather pouch. But then once you get inside the car, you have to remove it from the leather pouch every time in order to put it in the dashboard hole so you can actually turn on the car, which seems kind of impractical. But then again, this ain't a Camry. And there are a couple of other interesting items in here, one of which is the battery. The battery in this car is not under the hood or in the trunk like in a lot of exotic cars. Instead, it's chilling in here with you. You lift up this little carpeted compartment directly behind the seats and you can see that's where they've decided to place the battery. The battery is heavy and so they put it sort of in the middle of the car in order to improve weight balance. Next up, we move on to the suspension button, which uses one of those glass buttons with one of those little light pipes like a lot of different items inside this car. The interesting thing about the suspension button is it includes a hidden mode. Right now it's in normal mode and if you press it you go into sport mode which tightens up the suspension makes the car handle a little better but if you press and hold the suspension button you go into track mode which is probably something that a lot of Aston Martin owners don't even know their car can do but in fact it can do it. Another hidden easter egg in this interior that most people probably don't know about you have the mirror controls over on the driver's door panel left mirror right mirror etc but if if you hold down L and R at the same time, the mirrors fold in. Nobody knows about this. I guarantee there are V8 Vantage owners watching right now going, my mirrors will fold in? And the answer is yes on all Vantage models. Another interesting item is the gauge cluster. The gauge cluster in this car isn't particularly unusual except that the RPM gauge goes in the opposite direction. So when you rev the engine, it actually goes counterclockwise instead of clockwise like every other tachometer in every other car. Another thing that's kind of unusual about this car, like I said, it has a manual transmission. It isn't just a regular manual, it's a seven speed manual, which is already a little unusual on itself, but more unusual, it's a dog leg. What that means is that first gear is down and to the left instead of up and to the left, like in basically every other car. So when you shift into first, you move it over to the left and then down, which is where reverse is in a lot of other vehicles. There are a couple of interesting reasons for doing this. One is that seven speeds is an odd number of gears, so you gotta put first somewhere weird or seventh somewhere weird, and they chose first. Another is it puts second and third directly in a line, which means that if you're on a track, those are probably the gears you'll most be going back and forth from, and they're easier to get to straight down and up rather than having to shift over between second and third. Next, we move on to the center control stack where there are a couple of interesting features, starting with the buttons themselves. They're not actually buttons. Instead, there are four like glass pads and you tap each item you want to turn on or off. So for example, you want to turn on the air conditioning, you just sort of tap it and then it turns on. Now, surprisingly, this works really well well, it's easy to turn everything on. It's very receptive to your touch, which really surprised me. I wasn't expecting that from Aston Martin, a low volume brand like this, developing something that works that well. But still, there are a couple of interesting quirks to this. For example, turning on the map light isn't as simple in every other car. You just kind of tap a button here on the ceiling next to the mirror and it turns on. In this car, you actually have to sort of reach down onto the glass pad and tap a little button that looks like a dome light. And that turns on the map light, which is located behind the mirror. This is the kind of thing most Vantage owners that are driving in the day probably tap this thing and nothing happens and like what does this even do but the answer is it turns on the map light another interesting item is the climate control dials now you'll see these dials are made of aluminum and as you turn them you can adjust the airflow or the temperature they feel very nice inside them there's another glass button you can press it turn it to auto or on the other side turn it to recirculating air pretty simple the cool thing about these dials is as you turn them the screen displays whatever you're showing down here on the actual center control stack and it just displays it using the gun barrel look from the start of the James Bond movies, drawing that connection between Aston Martin and James Bond, and that is kind of a cool touch. Next, moving on to the outside of this car, I'm gonna start in the back, and specifically with the Aston Martin badge. Now, here's something I didn't know. The Aston Martin badge in this car is black in the middle where it says Aston Martin, and that's because this is a special series limited edition car, the Stick Shift V12 Vantage S. If you get a regular series Aston Martin, like just a run-of-the-mill DB11, you get a green Aston Martin badge. Meanwhile, they reserve the red Aston Martin badge for their Zagato cars when they team up with the Italian design house 
in-house Zagato. So the badges are color-coded, who knew? Next up, we move on to how to get into the trunk, which in this car is actually a hatchback. Now, in a lot of cars, you, there's a little popper thing under the sill plate by the license plate. You put your hand down, it pops it open, but not in this car. In this car, there are three ways to get in the back. One is on the key, there's a little button that pops it open. Another is there's a switch inside, you pull it and it opens up. The last one is my favorite, however. With the doors unlocked, you walk up to the back of this car and press this little silver button located right below the third brake light. This little silver button, unlabeled, kind of beautiful actually, but it's just a trunk popper. Next up, we move on to what's in the trunk because you get a lot of stuff when you buy an Aston Martin. There is, for example, a battery tender, which comes in this box. This contains a tire inflator kit. No surprise. There is an Aston Martin branded first aid kit, shrink wrapped in package, or else I would open it up and make fun of it. This is a mounting bracket for the front license plate, if you live somewhere that has one. And then there is my personal favorite thing, and that would be this screw. It comes separate from all that stuff, by itself. I have no idea what it's for. It is one single incredibly tiny screw that comes with the purchase of your Aston Martin. And no, it didn't fall out of something. Everything else is locked up, shrink wrapped, stuck in a package, except for the screw. Now, another interesting item you get inside the trunk of this car is the Aston Martin umbrella. It is sort of tucked away in its umbrella location at the very top of the trunk, so you wouldn't even see it unless you were looking for it, but it comes with the purchase of every Aston Martin. Now, I mentioned before that I had a 2006 Vantage and my umbrella came with my car. I had an Aston Martin umbrella. Unfortunately, I left it in an Uber in Washington, D.C. Aston Martin umbrella is like $300, so that was the luckiest Uber driver in the world that day. A couple of other interesting items around back. One is the fact that in the cargo area, there's a surprising amount of room. This is a hatchback after all, and it's fairly roomy. You can store stuff back there. There are even little hooks for a cargo net. If you want to put a cargo net in the back of your Aston Martin, and there's even a cargo cover so it can cover up your important goods that you're transporting in the back of your Aston. The other important item to mention back here is the noise. This car has quite an impressive exhaust note, as you shall hear. <laughs> Next up, we move on to another interesting quirk on the outside of the car, and that would be the tail lights. As you can see, when the tail lights are off, they're just clear. It doesn't look like they would emit anything but white, clear light. However, when you turn the car on, you can see that there are brake lights, there are tail lights, there are turn signals that just sort of appear as if out of nowhere in these clear lights, which is kind of a cool look, especially on a white car. It's just sort of monochrome on the outside. Now, one other interesting item up front, when you actually go around and open up the hood, you will quickly discover that the engine is absolutely massive. Now, like I mentioned, I owned a V8 version of this car, and seeing the V12 crammed in here is just crazy. It's incredible this massive engine fits in this relatively small car. Next up, we move on to a couple of other interesting quirks on the side of the car. I'm gonna start with the fuel door. Now, first, the interesting quirk is opening the fuel door itself. It's not a little latch or lever you pull. Instead, it's in the driver footwell. It's a button that looks just like all the other buttons inside the interior, except this particular one isn't glass, since you you would probably kick it and break it. Still, you open the fuel door with a button, which is on. But the thing I like most about the fuel door is the languages on the inside of it, which appear to correspond sort of to exactly how much Aston Martin prioritizes each market. English is the largest, and then other languages are sort of progressively smaller as they become less important to Aston Martin. Finally, we move on to the doors, which come with a couple of interesting quirks, one of which is that the door handles are flush against the doors. This is becoming more and more common. In this car, it's kind of an unusual way you open the door, you push the front of the door handle, then the back part sort of opens out so you can pull it open. And once you've pulled it open, you'll notice two interesting things about the doors. One is that they open at an angle. It's 12 degrees. Aston Martin calls this the swan doors. There are two purposes for this. One is that it makes the car sort of look like it has wings. It looks very nice when the doors are open. Also, it allows the car to clear curbs better. So it's a low car. If you park it near a curb, the door opens up, then you know it won't hit the curb. And speaking of the door opening up, it's also worth noting this door has what's called an infinity hinge, which means you can place it anywhere and it will stop. It won't move, which is a pretty cool idea. And frankly, it makes it easy if you're in a tight space and you can only open the door precisely this much. It'll stay right there. And so that's a tour of the V12 Vantage S. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the V12 
Vantage S. Believe it or not, the dog leg thing is not actually all that weird once you're actually doing it because you're trained to just upshift to the next gear wherever you are sort of in the range. And you don't think, oh, it's weird that I'm shifting from first to second. You just think, oh, I'm down into the left. The engine is loud, so now I must go up into the right. And that's just kind of normal. You don't, you don't find it all that strange when you're actually doing it. The one part of it that's a little bit weird is first gear because it's a little strange to go into first by going down or to the left. But otherwise, you just sort of naturally progress to the next gear like you would in any other car. And one of the first things I noticed driving this thing, it's a, this, this clutch is a little stiff. The accelerator's a little stiff, the gear lever's a little stiff. This is sort of like the old school. The sound is just amazing. It really, really has a good sound to it. Going around a corner right there, it feels good. It feels uh, nice and easy to put around the corner. The steering is heavy, which I love. In the newer exotic cars, the steering's a lot lighter, everything's electric, it just doesn't feel quite as good. But in this particular car, because it has sort of an older design that's rooted in the 2000s, uh, it still feels like that, that nice, heavy, really connected to the road feeling that you sort of used to get before electric steering became more of a thing. It is weird when I'm cruising along high in the rev range with the gear lever up and it feels like third, but actually it's second going down into third. I guess there is, it is a little bit unusual, but you get used to it quickly, I think. The interior of this car is very beautiful. Alcantara, carbon fiber, aluminum, um, the glass buttons, everything just feels really nice. The ride quality is pretty good as it sort of always is in Aston Martins. You know, Aston's do this great job of sort of bridging the gap between luxury and performance. Uh, and this car specifically is a, a nice sporty car. I love the size, the gear lever, you throw it around, it's a lot of fun, but, um, Whoa, whoa, wow. <laughs> you know, that was one of the most surprising acceleration runs I've ever had. Um, because, not because it was that fast, I mean, it's fast, but because I remember this cockpit from my V8, my V8 was nothing like this. Man, this thing hauls. The steering is excellent. The handling is not as good as a, as a modern mid-engine supercar like a 488 or something like that. Uh, nor do you expect it to be. It's an old design. It's front engine. It's not really the purpose. But the steering is wonderful. I love this old hydraulic steering with a good solid feel to it. Man, pushing the pedal. This car is quick. I mean, it's a ton of power. I don't know why I expected anything else but wow, this thing is fast. The really impressive thing is just being able to shift your own on a V12. How cool is that? Man, this thing, this car is legitimately really fast. It's funny because it does sort of feel like the old school. And so you're driving this and it's like, well, this is the old Aston Martin. How could this be modern car fast? You don't really feel like it's going to be. And then you drive it, it's like, oh, I'm wrong. And that's the 2017 Aston Martin V12 Vantage S. It's a manual supercar in a world of automatics. And while it may seem outdated compared to the new one, that's kind of the point. It's an old school Aston and it's a lot of fun. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Vantage is beautiful, but the design is aging and I swear the earliest models look best with a cleaner, simpler design. It gets an eight out of 10. Next up is acceleration. The V12 Vantage S does zero to 60 in something insane like 3.7 seconds and it gets an eight out of 10. Handling is good, but not on par with the very best of today and it gets a seven out of 10. Fun factor is high, the Vantage sounds great and it's a hoot to drive and it gets an eight out of 10. Cool factor is good, but not too good. This is a familiar car and early examples with a very similar design are common and cheap. Still, it's a V12 Aston and it gets a seven out of 10 for a weekend score of 38 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. This car has some decent tech, but it also lags behind the competition without many of the latest modern gadgets and it gets a five out of 10. Comfort is good, better than most exotics, but not exactly supple, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is okay, reliability is a concern, of course, and the interior has some cheap bits, but mostly it's a beautiful place to spend time, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is decent for a car like this, and it gets a 3 out of 10. 
Value is a bit harder, but with the new one coming out, this one's going to depreciate heavily, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total daily score of 25 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 63 out of 100, and you can see how it compares to rivals. I especially point you to the Mercedes AMG GTS. The GTS costs way less than the Vantage, but the Mercedes is just as fast, it has better tech, it's more comfortable, and resale value is higher. I can't see any reason why anyone would buy the Aston over the AMG GTS, unless of course you want that third pedal, which actually is a pretty good reason.